Welcome to another inspiring podcast from C3 New Hope. For more information about our church and its locations, please visit our website at c3newhope.com.au. Do my favourite old joke. You're happy with who you're sitting next to? If not, you can get up and move. Um, I'm proud of Dan and Allie. Claire and I are proud of Dan and Allie. They're doing a magnificent job leading our church. Yeah, you're gone. You're in a clappy mood, so you might as well. <clears throat> and uh, they are gifted and they're skilled and they're called. And uh, on top of all of that, the icing on the cake is they're committed to you people. And um, that's no small thing. And so you're going to hear at various points through the message today some good reminders about Many things, including pray for your pastors. It's easier for me to say that now, now that I'm not the pastor. But pray for your pastors because uh, it's an opposed journey. And uh, I had an interesting experience last night. For the first time in 10 months, I had a restless Saturday night sleep, which is fascinating and annoying all at the same time. Well, most of you don't know, because I don't think I would tell you uh, a while ago, is that I used to have disturbed sleep every Saturday night, where I would usually sleep about an hour, uh, often tormented by uh, dark dreams and uh, dark visions, and just opposed and worn down because I was carrying God's word to bring to you. And so it's a little taster that the pastors who lead us in our church, they are opposed And they stand in a place with their children, with their family, that is a place before God and before us, not as mediators, because we know we don't have to go through a mediator anymore because of what Jesus did, but they are standing in a way where they're doing it with all their heart and soul. And that shouldn't be taken for granted, because actually, uh, as a pastor of a church, whether the church is small or large is irrelevant. It takes a huge bank of emotional energy and focus and determination to be committed to a body of people with heart and soul. So I urge you to pray for them. Uh, If you are writing notes, and it might be a good idea to do that, I do have a title for my message this morning. It's going to be short, both the title and the message, and then we're going to have prayer time. Uh, But the title of my message this morning is Start With Surrender. Start with surrender. Now, we could meditate just on that title alone for 15 or 20 minutes and it would speak volumes to our heart. Beginning, first of all, and quite obviously, this idea that instead of making surrender the last port of call, it would be useful, and I'm included in this, it would be useful if we made surrender our first port of call, that before we head out and we start off and we make plans and we put things in place and we begin to orchestrate God the way we want him into our plans. Put your hand up if you've been guilty of that once or twice. Ah, oh, seven of you. Awesome. So spirit of lying is going to have to be dealt with before the end of the meeting. I know I've done it where I head out and I start making all kinds of plans. And before too long, I realize that I've just gone. And then I try to fashion God into the plans I've already made. And actually, the word in Proverbs 16 says to us, commit your plans to the Lord. Not commit the Lord to your plans. (laughs) I know they sound similar, but they are wildly different. Commit your plans to the Lord, and then He will make you a success. If I'm being perfectly honest, and I will be perfectly honest, I never had anything to hide before. I'm not about to start now. The truth is, I didn't want to preach today. (laughs) That's the truth. Uh, I have preached once since my final message here last year on the 5th of December as lead pastor. I've preached once uh, in a friend's church in August, uh, and I was reminded how emotionally taxing that is. I felt tired for days. Uh, That could be old age as well. Uh, But coming towards uh, this Sunday, I didn't want to preach today. And partly because, to be honest, I felt empty in regards to whether or not I had anything to offer you or bring to you. 
you may be like me, you might not be like me, but 2022 has been a challenging year for me. Not because of the handover of our church, that's actually been the easiest, breeziest part. Because that's been in the perfect plan and timing of God's will. But 2022 has been a challenging year. It's been challenging with starting a new chapter and starting a new business from scratch and I've had some health challenges this year. Uh, I'm not going to go deep into it, but I want to lay the platform for helping you to feel empowered that we need to come to God with our stuff. It's always the practice that we should go for, but we're being reminded again today. Had some health challenges earlier in the year. I spent uh, several visits in hospital. I spent three months barely able to sleep because I was convinced that I was about to die of a heart attack. Um, I was getting all kinds of symptoms that may be pointing in that direction. Uh, I've since found out then that that is not the case, that my heart is fine, and that more than likely I've suffered an injury from the vaccine that we were all coerced into taking last year. But that's been challenging. And so this year, I have had to be reminded again, almost as if my faith was starting out on its first baby steps another time, that I need to lean on God. And so I didn't really want to preach today, and I was once again suffering the preacher imposter syndrome. Those of you who haven't preached don't really understand by experience what I mean by that, but you need to understand that pastors and preachers will often go through what we would call an imposter syndrome. You get up and preach on a Sunday, then you go home and suddenly you come down off that mountain heights of moving in the Spirit of God and preaching God's Word and you go home and you eat a Subway. And it's all suddenly very, very normal. And again, this idea that ministers and all of us can be opposed by dark forces. I had countless occasions where I would preach and minister here And many of you would say kind words, which I appreciated, and then I would go home and for the remainder of the day be uh, uh, tormented by dark voices saying, who are you to talk to those people? Who qualified you? Who said you could stand up and say something? What have you got to offer as if your life is all together? And so I was suffering these things again, and I was complaining to God about the fact that I had to preach. Well, I didn't have to. I was asked. I could have said no, and I seriously contemplated it. Uh, About three weeks ago, I was going to message everybody and say, take me off the roster. I don't have anything to offer anyone. Just leave me alone. And so I was complaining to God and complaining and saying, Lord, I don't have anything to give them. And very clearly, I heard him respond and say, good, because they don't need you. They need me. And so... With that thought in mind, I want us to read a few passages of Scripture, and then I would like you to uh, prepare yourself now, prepare yourself now for 15 minutes' time, where you're going to be invited by me, via God's Spirit, to start again with surrender in many areas. I want to read to you first in John chapter 15. These translations will be on the screen, so if you happen to have a different translation, you can just read along. John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8, New King James Version. It's Jesus speaking, and he says, I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. Listen carefully to these words. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he reinforces the main thought again. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Reminds me of an old, old song we used to sing about 35 years ago with those same words. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me, somebody say if, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, 
so you will be my disciples. Why don't we close our eyes and take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your help today. We know that we need you, but in our prayer, we remind ourselves another time that we need you. Lord, I'm asking that in this room this morning, as you have already been preparing our hearts, we ask, we invite, we permit you, Holy Spirit, prepare us even further. Lord, you see us so clearly, not just our exterior mask and coverings, but you see our heart, you see our motives, you see our emotions, you see our thoughts, you know us so well. Lord, I'm praying for every person in this room and in this church that we will be empowered by your spirit to have courage to surrender to you another time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Say amen if you believe it. Another great passage that will help prepare our hearts is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, from the Message Translation. I love the way it words it. It says, are you tired? Anyone want to answer already? (laughs) Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Again, this is Jesus speaking to us. He says, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Isn't that a beautiful picture that God gives us there? I don't know about you, but for me, I find that occasionally, in little moments, I have fleeting glimpses and tastes and feelings of this scripture's promise to live freely and lightly. Who knows what I mean? Some people might call it serendipity. (laughs) Some people might go a little more Australian and say to themselves, how's the serenity? But there is something that resides in our soul, which is a God hardwired craving for the echoes of Eden. That God created us to live freely and to live lightly in His presence, in relationship with Him. And that all things that break relationship and take us out of His presence simply load up the bag that we are carrying around. Put your hand up if you've ever felt like you were carrying around a heavy, heavy backpack of stuff from your past, from your challenges. We all go through that from time to time. But God's Word has great promises for us and His Spirit is available to minister to us in such a way that we can be relieved of our heaviness. Let's read in Isaiah chapter 55, NIV translation, verse 1. It's the Spirit of God calling to us again, and it says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Now, clearly, the Scripture is speaking to us metaphorically here. It's not talking to us about transactional behaviors. It's talking to us about a connectedness of relationship whereby we can exchange what is quite useless in us for that which is priceless in Him. And this invitation is always open from God to our hearts. And it doesn't matter whether you find yourself in a heavy backpack season or in a lightly stepping, loving life season, the invitation is still there. Because the best of what we can experience in this life still pales into insignificance compared to what He can offer us in just one moment. And so I would urge us again to ready our hearts to say, I don't have to be in a place of desperation. I don't have to be in deep, deep struggle and darkness in order to turn to God. I'm actually allowed, empowered by Scripture, to ask for rain in a time of rain. That even when things are good, I'm still allowed to respond to the invitation that He says, come and drink, come and buy, come and get what you need from me. This is why when Jesus is asked the question throughout Scripture, who are you? His response is, I am. Now that sounds confusing 
to logic and to the cognitive response, but in our spirit, what he's saying there is, I am everything that you will need me to be when you need it. He will not allow himself to be defined by one moment, one season, one circumstance, one situation where we have this binary A to B, B to A contact point with him, but instead he lives omnipresent around us and in us and through us. This is why he can call himself I am. (laughs) This is why the gods of this world can only define themselves by one name and one trait and one way of operating, and one this, and one that. But Jesus Christ and His Father Yahweh can respond to the question by saying, I am, because He is. He is your I am on a bad day. He is your I am on a good day. He is your I am on a confusing day. He's your I am on a grieving day. He's your I am on every day. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. This next question challenges all of our hearts. Why spend money on what is not bread (laughs) and your labor on what does not satisfy? Have a think for a moment about the hectic pace of our world and the way millions upon millions of people are scurrying for bread that cannot bring sustenance. It's a false bread. It's the pursuit of things in isolation from purpose. There's nothing wrong with having things until they have us. And our world is scurrying at greater and greater velocity, thinking that the next thing and the next experience and the next like and the next follow and the next moment that your reels blow up and blah, 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 boring. None of it has any context or purpose separated from our Creator. He says, don't spend your life's resources on the things that can't satisfy you. Listen, listen to me, he says, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fear. One more passage? One more passage? Yes? No? Let's have a vote. One more passage? Those who want to go home, I've got to say, you, is it appropriate to say ballsy in church? I just said it. You'd have to be ballsy to put your hand up on that one, but I would give you credit and say, well, good for you for being honest, but I'm going to read the passage anyway, as you know, whether you voted for or against. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, in the Passion Translation. Now, let me do a little uh, quick advertisement here for Bible interpretation that may help some people. You may notice that I'm using several different translations this morning. Uh, Nothing wrong with that, but I would always urge people to build doctrine and sound theology on translations that are as close as possible to original language. For example, something like the New King James Version, something like NIV, something like these translations which have the greatest correlation to original text. Why? Because these incredible translations like the message that we have in recent times and the passion, they are for bringing extra light, extra color, other shades of language. And if you don't interpret that correctly, you can think that you're getting other shades of meaning, but actually you're not. And so when we read translations like the passion, take them for the enjoyment to our spirit that they are, but understand it's not different language, therefore different interpretation. It's complementary language to the original. Does that make sense? So here we are in Romans 12, verse one and two. Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? To surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices. And live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Wouldn't it be magnificent if we were recalibrated and re-educated by the Spirit of God to realize that passages like this are the core of what worship really means? And then we could refine and improve our language to say things like, let us worship the Lord with songs. Because the song is a vehicle. (laughs) The song is not the outcome. 
The scripture here is saying that the way that we live our lives before God is the truest act of our worship. This is why you can be tone deaf and never ever hit pitch and still be a great worshiper. We'd just like you to do it a little quieter if you could please because it's disturbing the rest of us. No, I'm kidding. Worship comes from the way we live our life before God and worship songs are just one form of expressing gratitude in worship. This becomes your genuine expression of worship. Look at this. Stop. This is pretty straight language for a fluffy translation. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. I love, not like, I love what Nick and Denise Diomas are doing in our youth ministry right now. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. I love it. Why? Because they're building our youth ministry in our church on many things, but at the centre of it, let's be truth seekers of what the Word of God actually says. And that will stand up well. That will stand the test of time. And you guys, I know, are on a mission from God to lead that way. Don't let anybody dissuade you. Have a resilience on the inside that smiles politely at people whilst reminding yourself you will not be budging the mission from what God told you to do. Because our young people desperately, desperately need a better way rather than being conformed to the lifeless, destructive patterns of the world's thinking. Scripture warns us, don't be conformed to it. But rather be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. Be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit. Why don't you close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine and picture what this process looks like as I'm reading it. Don't imitate the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. Rather, be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. Allow the Holy Spirit to make you into a new person, not just a better version of the old person, but a brand new person starting from the inside, which is your character via a complete reformation of how you think, letting go of the world's way, adopting God's way. You can open your eyes again. This will empower you. This, somebody say this. Somebody say what? The this that it's talking about is everything that just got described prior. Living that way. When you live that way, that will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. So many Christians will struggle for too long wondering what is God's perfect will for my life? Well, instead of starting with the question, start with the process of transformation because when you get transformed from the inside out, then God's will becomes perfectly clear to you. If you're scratching and searching for perfect will of God, it probably means you've started with the horse ahead Of the cart of the head of the horse, you know what I mean. (laughs) I was meant to go from there and segue into Melbourne Cup Day, but it's a bit of a train wreck instead. Let's move on. If we start with scratching around, what is God's will for my life instead of these passages? We will be easily, someone say easily, easily fooled into a poor substitute of the will of God for our life. Because our vision will be blurry and our perspective will be bent and we'll be fodder for the deceptive ways of the devil. When we live this way, suddenly the will of God becomes clear. Can I get my flow brothers to come to the stage, please? So this morning, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a few moments. You can stay in your seat, but we're going to open the altar. And I'm going to lead you in some prayers of surrender. Because we need to be reminded, I need to be reminded, often, to start with surrender. And I'm guilty, as some of you are, of rushing off and doing things my own way, in my own strength, making a mess of things. And then my last option becomes, perhaps I should just surrender everything. And the Holy Spirit 
releases an, a, a resounding duh. <laughs> How blunt and dull are you, Andrew? We should learn to practice to start with surrender. We hope you've been encouraged by this message. For more information about C3 New Hope and its locations, please visit our website at c3newhope.com.au.